And we're off. It is Car Con Carne, uh, the world's only food podcast recorded in a car, sponsored by our friends at Boost Mobile. The phone I'm doing the Facebook Live on is from Boost Mobile. My entire family is on the Boost Mobile plan. The Samsung Galaxy S9 is courtesy of Boost Mobile. That right there, a, a <laughs> Chicago favorite, the much beloved Frank Arl of Point Dog Pondering. <laughs> Thank you, brother. It's Car Con Carne. We are outside City Winery. We're on, I don't even know, we're right off Randolph here. Uh, City Winery isn't really a to-go type food place, but they gave us food to go tonight. Yep, and bad. the reason why we're at City Winery is because in just, what, a week and a half, you're here solo. Yeah, I'm going to do a solo show uh, August 2nd. Yep. So I want to talk about the show. I want to talk about you. I want to talk about Poi Dog Pondering. We have City Winery food, and I suspect this is not the kind of thing you want to let get, let get cold. Let's get, dig in. Man. Okay, let's dig in. I, now, you ordered duck tacos, and you ordered that without hesitation. Is yeah. that like a regular thing for you? I've never had it before, so okay. I thought I want to try it. Yeah, okay. I love duck, so I'm, I'm down with the duck. This cracks me up. I just have to say this. Did you say down on purpose because of duck? I, I didn't think of that. Let's duck down on those duck tacos. Uh-huh. Uh, peas and carrots, you know the things with movies, like when they, uh, peas and carrots, peas and carrots, rhubarb, 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 you know, like when, when people need to yes. talk in the background, uh-huh. they need to look like they're, uh... All right, so you got duck tacos. I got scallops. We're breaking the fish barrier tonight Good man. on the podcast. Duck tacos. And again, this isn't a typical, uh, arrangement here for City Winery. They were kind enough, because you're Frank Oral, uh, they provided food to go. <laughs> do you eat before you play, or do you have to wait until after you're off stage? I'll eat, like... A couple of pieces of cheese. Maybe cheese, a really? Yeah, I mean, you, I, you don't get like dairy throat? Nothing. I have a throat like a tank. I was a street musician for about, you know, for a long time. And so my throat, like nothing stops it. I mean, literally, except for a really bad cold. But like, yeah, I don't know. But, you know, in other words, like, say backstage, there might be like some cheese and crackers or some crudite or something like that. And that I can do before showtime, you know. All right. So what is this? This is burrata? That's the burrata, yeah. I don't know what burrata is. It's a cheese. It's a kind of like a... It's got mozzarella on the outside and then kind of like a... Yeah, then they've got a lot of bread. We're mostly just seeing the bread there. But the, but it's a really nice... Uh, it's like kind of got like a mozzarella on the outside and then mm-hmm. ricotta on the inside. So they clearly pack this because you are Chef Frank. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. But I love me some burrata. See, it's funny. I had a friend absolutely freak out when I said that you were going to be doing this podcast with me tonight. And... The, the irony is, you are such an approachable, down-to-earth dude. Like, there, there's nothing rock star about you, other than the really cool rock star shirt. Right on. Yeah, good. I mean, I, you know, I've met, uh, well, first of all, I just really, I love people. I mean, that's where everything happens. Like, I love meeting people. I love getting to know what people do. I love people that do all kinds of things for a living. And I couldn't imagine ever isolating myself from that. And the other thing, too, is that, like, I've, I've warmed up for enough people in my life that I've watched enough famous people act badly. I remember <laughs> going, like, I'm not going to do that. I'm not, you know, like, if anyone ever comes up and talks to me, we're going to talk. And, there's, you know, I mean, it's just, but, but that's just a side card to the fact that I really just, I really find people fascinating. So it's like, it's really fun. That's why I love doing the chef nights. Because, you know, like, hey, I want to talk about this. Frank goes to people's houses, picks out a menu, cooks for them, and plays in their homes. Yeah. I mean, that, there, there's a certain fearlessness, I think, in doing that. It's really fun. I mean, like, uh, you know, I, I fell into it by, kind of by accident. I, um, I was doing, um, I was missing, you know, I did start out as a street musician, and then um, I was, I love playing on stage, I love it, you know, it, so, where you really think about the show, you put in like, you know, surprise elements, you always have tricks up your sleeve, there's all these things that, show day, I just love it, mm-hmm. but I also love just the sitting around the living room, strumming the songs, and, you know, playing, and, you know, and figuring out the chords on the spot, you know, and um, so, you know, like if somebody says, what about Dylan, and you go, okay, what are the chords to that song, and then work it out. I, I miss that kind of thing. And so I started doing some living room concerts about 15 years ago. But it was like kind of like a very weird situation. Like you would show up at the house. They would say, the party starts around 8. Why don't you come around, you know, 8 o'clock and then have a drink and then play maybe around 8.30 or 9. And I wouldn't get to know the people first. And I'd be playing for them. And I was like kind of going, well, I'm in your house. I was like, I remember thinking we should be eating dinner first. We should be having and a glass pick- of wine. And then... 
do you figure out what songs to play just based on the people you meet? I don't even think about what I'm going to play until I get to the house. Really? Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, first thing I do is I, I get to the house four hours early. I prep for four hours before anyone gets there because I need to be... I need to have my prep time, and so I get that done, and then the people come, and then um, and then we hang out, we have dinner, and then later on we play music, and then when we sit down and play music. It's totally, I'll maybe think, I'll maybe start with a song, you know, just to get things going. Then after that, it's like what people want to hear or what they. I just let it I follow the flow. This is so fascinating because I think so many musicians are introverted. By nature. I mean, on stage, they explode, they come alive. Uh, you are not that person. And I guess going back to being a street performer, like busking on a, I mean, that, that takes a certain level of yeah. courage and fearlessness. I was and, scared to hell the first time I did it. Yeah? yeah, 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 for sure. First time I played on the street, I was like, yeah, yeah. Well, let's jump around a little bit. I want to talk about yeah. you know, Chef Frank and all, all your different performing stuff. But I just thought about, you know, in terms of being afraid to perform somewhere, what was it like when you played Letterman? And there's the burrata. There you go. Okay. So that's got that's like kind of got. You can see it's got the like hard mozzarella on the outside, then the soft like. Oh my uh, gosh. Yeah, soft uh, uh, ricotta on the inside. Ooh, that's delicious. Yeah. Do you remember playing Letterman? I sure do. I remember everything about it. Were you, were you scared? Um, no, I wasn't scared. I was exhilarated. I was like, um, you know, I mean, I was pretty reckless in those days. I mean, not what I mean is reckless. The reckless is not really the right way, but in other words, like. I showed up in New York to play the David Letterman show without a guitar. Like, like you know, I just I knew my friend Arnie would have a guitar. I was mm-hmm. like, Arnie, can I borrow your guitar? Yeah. So he, I borrowed Arnie's guitar. So I'm playing Arnie's Gibson on that thing, or Gill. I don't know what it was now. I think it's a Gibson. But um, and um, and we showed up, and I had holes in my jeans. You know, what I mean, it was just like you know. But that's just the way you know. That's yeah. the way I. That's the way you. That's the way I dressed. I never. You know, my my whole thing is like it's not that I. I, I, I sleep in my stage clothes. And so right. whatever my clothes are, that's what I, you know, that's what I wear. And then, um, and we went on, we went on the show and, uh, the things I remember about it, it was really cold. David likes the cold yep. studio. Um, uh, they were really nice to us. They gave us a room that we sat in. We waited for Dave. Dave came in with like a basketball wearing like sweats and he'd just come from playing basketball, went into his room, he came by, said hello to us. They went into his room, came out with a suit on. And it's like, you know, they shoot that thing at like four in the afternoon and we went and played it. And I was, to be really honest, um, I was, um, I was not into it because I had kind of like, um, a young punk attitude about Paul Schaefer. I kind of thought that he was like a, just a jobber musician, you know, a jobber. you know, like, you know, like, and I, and, and as a, as a, as an ex punk, I have like ex, you know, I have uh-huh. strong feelings about that kind of stuff. I go, he doesn't care. He's just up there doing whatever it is. We got there. Those guys learned our song for Batum. They learned, they took the time to learn it and they gave it the love that, you mm-hmm. know, here's the thing about da- playing the David Letterman show back in those days, you had to use his band. Yeah. Right. And, um, so that was kind of a piss off to us. You know, we were pissed off that we had to use their band and, um, but it was good promotion. We just thought, hey, okay, we're going to do it. But we were we were a little bit cocky about it. But you know, Bruce, our bass player, is playing Glockenspiel, and mm-hmm. you know, we put everybody. In you the found band. a way to make it yeah, work. Yeah, yeah. And then, um, but you know, we went away with respect uh, for for Paul and the whole band. Like they learned the song, they they gave it love. They ma- they treated it right. They you know they ran it till we were happy with it. And I I, I ate my words afterwards. I was going right on. Oh, that was cool. You know. And jumping back uh, to the chef Frank. How long have you been doing that now? I've been, um, I don't know, good question. 12, 12 years, maybe 15 years. So you're obviously, you're a food fan. You're a foodie, you're a food enthusiast. I like to eat. How does how does that come out of being a touring musician? Because you're working on per diems. You're, you're running close to the bone. How do you even get the chance to explore food and like immerse yourself in just good dining? No, good question. I mean, uh, um, you know, even when we were street musicians, um, and we would make like twelve to fifteen dollars a day. That's we, as a band. That's as a band. <laughs> so we would still, if we were around a place that had a kitchen, we camped out a lot during that time. Mm-hmm. Also, we were, we traveled across the states doing it. Sure, you slept on a lot of floors. Yeah, and we slept on a lot of floors. So if there was a kitchen, you can take that fifteen dollars and you can buy a terrible bottle of red wine. We always had wine with dinner, so you always mm-hmm. you get a terrible bottle of red wine. You get uh, a good pasta. bottle of red wine, by the way, can be found at City Winery. Yeah, there you go. Uh-huh. <laughs> and um, and uh, we would uh, buy uh, pasta and peas and olive, a little jar of olive oil and maybe some, you know, 
oregano or something like that, um, maybe a can of tuna fish, and all of a sudden you have pasta for like six people. It's like one of those for, food challenges on a Food Network show. Yeah. Here, here are your shitty ingredients. Yeah. Make a meal out of it. Yeah. Make something magical. So, I mean, we were, even back then we were trying to eat, you know, but, you know, I mean, like, and then, okay, and then the touring thing, that's an interesting question, so I'm, I'm like kind of circling around it because, uh, you know, then the other thing is that you go out on the road and then you're looking for something good and it's, and, um, and you know, and I can't really eat that much before the show. So I mean, like, yeah. good for me can be like, at that time when Poi Dog was out, I was uh, pescatarian, mm-hmm. so I would be at the truck stop. I would just get the cheese. You sandwich. only ate Joe Pesci, is what exactly? That means. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which is weird. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> salty too. <laughs> <laughs> but Italian, if you like Italian. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And then, um, and then, uh, um, and then later on, you know. Um, we sort of got into food. I mean, you know, one of the, I mean, this is going to be terrible. It's going to sound terrible, but well, you know, when we got signed to Sony, we were actually being pursued by a few labels at the same time. Sure. So, um, Max used to have this thing, whoever takes us out to the best dinner gets to sign That's, us. I, I think that was the norm. I mean, so that we was, were like pushing that stuff. We were like going out that was ordering that era, the best though, right? wine. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's like, you know, and then, uh, but so, I mean, that maybe put a little bit of taste in our mouth for the food. Um, but, um, certainly later on, like when you're on tour, you can eat a lot. You know, they'll sh- the clubs will, Tipitinas, we used to play Tipitinas in New Orleans. They used to put out fried fish, fried shrimp, fried uh, French fries. They would do the whole thing like this and go, here's your employee meal and be like, there's no way I can eat that and go on stage. And so I sort of learned, and a few of us in the band sort of learned right away to just go take your money and after sound check, go eat somewhere really well and maybe you just eat so, some someplace really good and just eat really well, like have a nice salad, mm-hmm. have a nice like appetizer, have a nice thing, digest before the show. But so I got into just spending my per diem like an, on one meal a day, and the, and, and you, you made know, it count. Yeah, made it count. Yeah, exactly. And I still do that to this day. Yeah, that's smart. All right, I do want to mention as we're uh, working on the podcast, I want to make sure we, we are eating the food. Oh yeah, uh, they gave us something called the snack trio. It looks like what are, what are we looking at here? It's very unusual for them. This is a popcorn yeah, of some see. sort. I know it's going to have some kind of twist. Wow, that's delicious, but I don't even know what it is. Try the popcorn. There's a pretzel. There's a taste I can't I can't nail, but I'm sure you can. Yeah. I know is that herbs. I, I taste sugar in there. Yeah, I know there's sugar for sure. That thing, I don't know what it is. It's tasty though. All right. <laughs> That's how good City Winery is. We don't know what we're eating and we love it. <laughs> oh, wow. It's got a little sweet and savory thing going on there. Yeah. My goodness. So you're stretching the dollar. You're touring. The Sony thing didn't, that just didn't work out. Would you say that pomegranate was the Declaration of Independence for Poydog Pondering? Absolutely, good, good call. I like your, I like your style there. That's tr- totally true. I mean, we got off of Sony, we got ditched, wait, we got dropped by Sony, which was great because I didn't like it, and I was glad to get off of it. Well, for then, someone who has a self-described punk rock spirit, I mean, that is like the biggest of the major label, we will crush you, empire type. But label. I was very happy on our indie. We were on a little indie called Texas Hotel. We were just great art forward folks, you know, friends with all the REM guys. Like their idea of a trip would be, let's go to visit some folk artists. Their idea of like how we're going to hang out together. Mm. And then, uh, but you know, like when you're, when you're band leader for a lot of people and then there's interest from a label and they lost of your manager and your lawyer and your band members are kind of looking at you like the, you can't look this in the mouth, you know. It's actually like a big deal. Yeah. They could, they can get us national, you know. They yeah. can do it. So it's like, so we had it. Like it's, you know, it's a weird way that things make sense. And then, uh, but I was never really comfortable with that. So when we did get dropped, when we did start our own label, it was like, as you say, it was definitely like a rebirth. And a, I felt like we got our integrity back. I felt like mm-hmm. we, um, you know, and and we've never looked back. You know, we've just kept the kept our own label, and it's. Uh, and it gives us just beautiful, you know, just like we don't have to question what we think about. If we just feel like doing something, we just do it. And that was the biggest thing for me. Like, going, like we would we would decide, let's do this. And then it's like, are you sure you want to? Are you sure that's a really good idea? And all of a sudden you're going, oh, I'm not sure if that's a really good idea. And it's just no way to live, you know. Yeah, it's yeah. impossible to stay true to your art. Yeah, with that mindset. And that kind of leads to my next question. 
New Plant, you're doing a solo show here at City Winery. Again, we're mm-hmm. outside City Winery at uh, Randolph and what's is this Aberdeen? Racine, maybe? I think maybe Racine. Um, we're outside City Winery. You're doing it a solo show. Wow, fucking hell. Sorry. <laughs> so, it is Racine. So you're doing a solo show here on April 2nd. Poor Dog Pondering, I mean, really, especially ever since that moment in the mid-90s when you had your Declaration of Independence, Poor Dog has been whatever you've said it'll be musically. You've made musical statements. You draw from absolutely everything. Soul, house, opera, for God's sakes. I mean, you, 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 you dig into all of it, which makes me wonder, why does something need to be a Frank Oral solo record? I mean, couldn't the songs you write fall under Poor Dog because Poor Dog is whatever you say it's going to be. No, good question. Um, I think that, uh, um, and, and, and my first solo record that I made is a good, good description of why, why that happened. And that is because, um, I have been very, um, I let Poy Dog change radically with my every whim, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, um, I say we moved to Chicago, then we got very enveloped in the, in the whole house music world. So we, with that, it caused a lot of problems, you know, people kind of freaked out a little bit, but also people, loved it other people loved it it was like all these kind of things but also i realized that there's even as eclectic as poi dog is there's a thing that poi dog does and um if i'm too cavalier with changing around it really kind of throws people a little bit so if i keep it if i keep poi dog kind of in this realm and i create this other thing where i can do the experimental more experimental things it kind of keeps poi dog a little more stable and so for instance that first uh if you'll notice the first um solo record I did is almost all of it's almost all spoken word and it's all these spoken word things that I would float by the band and they wouldn't necessarily like they would be like I don't know about that one they always wind up on the B list you know are, are they and, overly polite in the way they dismiss you no, like, oh, I don't know Frank. no it's just sort of like it's more just a way of like you know like like I might put um, I might put something like never trade these days which is like a, a 12 minute long talking poem and then I might put uh, butterflies, which is, you know, kind of like uh, something else. And they go like, oh, I love that one, butterflies. You know, yeah, it's right. like that kind of thing. So it's all right. Like what I, when the, what I um, like in other words, that's, there's, there's enough material coming out. There's enough things where the way I look at it is that almost like my solo stuff is kind of like this launch pad for these other ideas. Because sometimes I'll put out songs that maybe got passed over, like I'll, I'll put them out to the band. Um, and people, they won't react to them, but I'll put them on the solo record, and they'll be like, how come we're not doing that song live? And then I circle them back into the mix. and then, Sure. So they get a little test flight, and the band gets to see how they are, you know? And it's not that, like, um, they're, I mean, they're very encouraging, and they're super creative, and they're and they're not, they're, it's not like they're not willing to take risks. It's just that I am really interested in a wide variety of music, and I have to figure out a way to, like, to present that so that way everybody's comfortable including the band and even people who like the records and things like that it can't be as cavalier as maybe i would normally be with the volume of people who've played in and around poor dog pondering through the decades now how do you know for sure that i wasn't a member at some point maybe i played clarinet for I you i totally thought you looked familiar yeah, when you see? came in the restaurant <laughs> you don't know for sure do you it's so many people in, in and around the band i know i was looking back over one of our like uh you know we used to make these homemade cassette albums and it's like um there was some guy that we met in San Francisco who was our mandolin player, and I looked at the thing, and I was like, I can't remember this guy's name now, but it just said, Jesus, parentheses, the mandolin player. <laughs> now, I'm sure you're well aware, next year is the 30th anniversary since your debut. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, 88. Yeah, you're right. Okay. Well, now you're aware. Now I'm aware. Uh, I know 25th was a, was a thing. 30th seems like a thing, too. Yeah. That's, that, that's, that causes for some duck. <laughs> we're, we're busting <laughs> open the duck tacos. All right, can you try to hold yeah, that yeah, up yeah, since yeah. we're on Facebook Live? Okay, so can you see that at all? Like, it's hard to see, It right? smells amazing. Yeah, it does. Oh, okay. my gosh. It kind of looks like Kalua Pig for any of those any of those Hawaiians out there. It's got that Kalua Pig look Your history to it. is so fascinating to me. <laughs> you just effortlessly talk about, you know, coming to Chicago, my time in Hawaii. I mean, you've done so much. You've experienced so much, and it's... It's awesome. I mean, Thanks, it's, it's made you the musician you are today. Yeah, the, no. The cultural bullion base you've kind of built your career on. Mm, that's delicious. That looks amazing. All right, I'm going to, this is going to be an adventure, Frank. I have the gazpacho mm-hmm. from City Winery, which looks delicious. I know there's corn in here. Clearly there's corn. Um, I don't think I have a spoon. 
Oh, shit. Sorry. Can That's you okay. swear on this thing? Sure you I can. swear like a sailor. It's a podcast. Okay. No? Yeah, no spoon. You so can might, just drink that thing like a I, I might like drink a cocktail. This, yeah, like, like a cocktail. <laughs> so, cheers. We're going to have some gazpacho. I haven't had... I haven't had gazpacho in years. I love it's, this. Is the time of year, I and mean, this is it for real. Mm-hmm. I've, I know it's one like the when the when the weather hit like this. Oh, oh man, tasty! This is a, wow. This is so flavorful. When we had that super hot blast, one of the first thing I made was um, gazpacho and Greek salad. It's like those, you know, they're just like you like the feta. Yeah. You know, also just good, cool, you know, mm-hmm. good, cool food for hot weather. I'm going to slurp on microphone, which is, it's sexy. <laughs> yeah. It's sexy, let's be honest. Yeah. So do you have a favorite, like, I know you like to do a lot of, correct me if I'm wrong, locally sourced, like to be kind of mindful with the ingredients you pull together. Yeah, I started out that way. Um, I, I, I know that, that that's on the website. I, I mean, to be honest, I started out that way and then... Um, it became hard to do, you know. What I mean, it's like um, even Whole Foods is like, uh, which you know used to be straight up Whole Foods store. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, uh, you know, what do you call it? Yeah, yeah, Whole Foods store, um, health food store. Now it's kind of evolved into where you have to really look for the organic stuff, or even the local stuff's hard to find. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, the uh, I that's I would say that's one of my biggest frustrations about doing stuff now is that you, know, you go out to eat and you might get like shiso leaf at a Japanese restaurant you know that nice fragrant leaf and you can't find it anywhere unless I go to uh, Mitsua way on the north side um, or you know like yet like uh, I went to the bad hunter down there and they had like pea tendrils which are like you know the big long they look like mm-hmm. you know look like and uh, you can't I can't find them in a the store anywhere you know, so. so all right so that makes me crazy I would I would like I wish there was you know like the way Stanley's mm-hmm. up there on Elston I wish there was one that was like just all from Michigan, Wisconsin, Illinois, you know, like, and then you just bought uh, stuff in there. I would support that. Do you have a favorite type of cuisine? Like, if, if you were to put together the quintessential Frank Oral menu for one of your house parties for Chef Frank, what, what, how would it lean? Would it be Asian? I, uh, I love both. I mean, I, 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 my, my two favorite zones are. Uh, this, the the Mediterranean, you know, like you know, Spain, France, Morocco, Italy, um, Greece, mm-hmm. Turkey. That that whole that whole, you know, going up to Turkey and everything. That whole area, and then I love Japanese and Vietnamese. Well, those are my some of my my things. When I I would say um, if I was gonna if you were gonna take me out back and shoot me, I would cook some oxtails like. Like Jamaican style oxtails, which is like no Spanish style, which is the Jamaicans do it the way the Spanish do it, where you cook it slowly and mm-hmm. you know like uh, and uh, so it's kind of like a slow braised kind of like um, beef bourguignon kind of a situation. I love Jamaican food. I, I cannot find many good places for yeah. it yeah. In, in the area. Yeah. Do you ever get tired of? Are there songs you get tired of playing, or do you look at them as kind of like? A treat for the audience. You look at it from that perspective. Yeah. No. Um, uh, the, the, well, there we have a kind of a, a, a policy in Poi Dog. Like I'll I'll put up a general list of songs before the show. Like I'll you know say we'll probably play twenty five songs in the course of a night. Maybe mm-hmm. you know, maybe twenty eight. Something Which like is that. a big. I mean that right there. That's epic. That's yeah. You're getting your money's worth. And then um, I'll so I'll make a list. I'll make a you know you know like kind of initial list of about forty songs. And I'll ask people for their chops and ads. Meaning like you know if they want to mm-hmm. they don't want to play the song. And um, the thing is, if somebody doesn't want to play a song, then we just take it off the list. So that way, nobody's ever playing something that they don't want to play. That's and cool. then, and we it's fairly democratic. Yeah, and then we, uh, and then that's how the songs keep from getting dry. And then we can we introduce songs that we haven't done for a little while. And um, but it is really true that um, to me, there's a different thing that happens when you play a song for um, you know people, and if people appreciate the song, the song has its own life, you know, mm-hmm. to it. And so. Um, if people are appreciating it, sometimes I do songs I do selfishly because I really want to do them. Mm-hmm. Sometimes we do songs because we know that people would love us to do the song. And um, and I and I, there was a time when I moved to Chicago. We never played anything from the first three records when we moved up here. We like we were just getting off of the whole Sony Columbia thing, and you were trying and to carve a new path. Yeah, and we just like didn't even play any of the stuff. Yeah. And it was it was, you know, some people were kind of upset about it, but it was like kind of. Um, 
you know, it was it was a way to kind of, and I was kind of like, I don't want to play that stuff anymore, you know. But I, I totally changed. I don't feel that way now. I sort of love all of our babies, you know. I get that, and you know, that was a different time, and you were making a much different musical yeah, statement. Like, we needed I, to make a break, you know, and, and start over, and you know. I totally you know, get that. Yeah, you're playing City Winery on the second. Is that a sort of situation where you do 25 songs, or do you scale it back if you're solo? Um, I don't know how many songs I'm doing, but uh, it'll be. It'll be a full set. I'm, I'm, uh, and um, I'm sort of developing this show called the the Suitcase Show, where, um, you know, when I was a kid, my dad was an astronomer. He used to travel. You know, uh, he would be gone a lot, and he would, the thing was, he would go to where ever there was um, a solar eclipse because he was a solar physicist, and he's always all things was always st- studying the corona. And how cool for you as, as a kid to like just be aware of that is your father's vocation yeah that's how we wound up in Hawaii because on top of the volcano yeah. very good observatories that's amazing you know, stuff so that's how we wound up there but I mean so I would always be like you know my dad would come home from these trips and he would come home with a suitcase and that suitcase was like supercharged you know like I couldn't wait for him to open the suitcase because out of it would come like he'd go to Puka Puka and he'd come back with like a carved canoe for my brother one time that was like unbelievable you know he'd come back in a shawl from Bolivia from my mom oh my God. you know so these things are like and then um, I'm regretting every snow globe I brought home for my kids right now by the way yeah yeah <laughs> uh, and then um, you know so this the idea for this show is just um, I'm um, like a, where you know I, I first it came out of uh, being this idea of uh, I want to be able to take a show around. there's not Poydog can only really go to like certain cities like you could go to New York San Francisco Austin we just went to Cleveland that was nice Seattle. It's hard for us to go to other cities. There's too many of us. We can't right. really afford to make it happen. Um, right. you're, and like then, tra- you're like Trans Siberian Orchestra at this point. Yeah, there's 15. I was like, you know, it's hard. But um, and then if I go out with a small group of people, as part of pondering, people always say to me, "Where's everybody else?" And so I thought, okay, all right, I can't do that. I'm going to go out as Frank Oral, and then I can go hit these smaller cities, and maybe I can wake up some of these cities so that way the band can come back through. That's smart. So then my. Um, the thing about this, so there's the idea of the suitcase show again. It's like a, a show that I can put in the suitcase. Yeah. And I use video, and I edit together these video backing tracks that go along with it, where I play, I videotape myself playing some of the instruments, very close up, so you just see my hands on the stuff like that. But it gives people a visual, and, and um, so that's what I'm going to be doing. And it's, it's, uh, it's a show that I'm developing, and then I'm going to get in the station wagon for about two months and just run around the, around the States. That's smart. You're, maybe Europe. You are Poi Dog's warm-up act Yeah. in other markets. Exactly, exactly. I know you're working on a new Poi Dog EP yep. right now. Now, my, I, I think that's kind of remarkable that you're even here right now because my understanding of you when you're in the writing process, I mean, you're all in. You're like basically sleeping near a, a mixing board and a guitar. Yeah. Yeah, I like to be totally immersive when, the, when that's happening. You kind of catch everything like the butterfly nets. So I, I, am I fucking you up right no, now? No, no, I'm good. It's like good to take a break, too. <laughs> okay. Well, good Lord. I like you can't sit alone with yourself too long with the guitar and the pen and paper. It's like, hi, And I should say, they're actually, I, I met Frank at City Winery tonight. I'm just standing around by the host stand. Frank emerges from the dining room, glass of wine in one hand, acoustic guitar slung over his shoulder. <laughs> it's like everything you'd want to have happen when you meet Frank Oral at a place like City Winery. It was, oh, thanks, it was brother. perfect. <laughs> you know, it's, it, we talked a little bit about just all the different things that make you, the, the, your cultural experiences. Chicago is such a big part of who you are at this point. I, yeah. I guess speak to that. Speak about your Chicagoness, your embeddedness. With this community and respect, you know, all due respect to people who are watching on Facebook Live right now. I, I know someone from Colorado just chimed in. Um, but talk a little bit about Chicago because it seems it's like such a big part of who Poi Dog is. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's interesting. Every city kind of like, you know, injects the band with something. You know, like when we were coming up in Hawaii, um, uh, Hawaii's got a, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a place that's stranded in the middle of the Pacific. We got all of our information by reading the Enemy and the Melody Maker. Yeah. We're very British, you know, like because uh, we're, you know, we didn't really read the Rolling Stones stuff like that. Yeah. We read the Melody Maker and things like that. But so your your imagination goes like that. Hawaii formed us in a certain way. Then we went to Austin, and Austin had its own vibe. I mean, anything from like country western swing to like you know the butthole surfers to I mean, it was just like this whole wide spectrum of stuff and then we got supported in a certain way there and then we moved to chicago and then yeah, you know, we came to chicago because we would tour through here we do this great corridor which is a you know you leave austin then you come up and you go through kansas city and lawrence and columbia yeah. 
and uh, St. Louis, and they come into Chicago, and it was just like, I used to love that run. I mean, it was great college towns, great stuff, and then we come to Chicago, and we got like uh, treated really nicely by um, you know by the lounge acts gals, mm-hmm. you know, Sue and Julia. Yeah, they were always so friendly to us, and um, Max was good friends with them, and that you know. So when and you everything kind of didn't play lounge acts as Poi Dog though, right? We sure did. Yeah, I, yeah. You also did a lot of like. Yeah, before we moved here, we would go play there as Poi Dog. Right. And then um, and then when 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 the Austin band, kind of, I mean, the Austin lineup of Poi Dog kind of fell apart after Columbia. And um, and Max and I moved up here to like just regroup and you know get our heads together and think about what we want to do. And I both of us wanted to live in a big city. Yeah. I never had that experience before. And um, and so we came up here and then um, and we started playing solo shows. Max and I at um, Lounge Acts. See, that's what I was as thinking. A, yeah. As an idea generator and as a way to meet other players and things like that. And then also the Millie's Orchid show was yeah. huge because we used to play in her band and then we would see all these performance artist people and we would see House of Maddox. We would see all these people yeah. come through there so that we quickly met a lot of creative people in town and then, you know, so Chicago's been huge for us. It's been like super supportive and super um, inspiring, you know, so... Um, I can't imagine living anywhere else. You know, that's. I was going to ask that. I mean, you you dropped anchor here in the mid '90s. It seems like you're not going anywhere. Yeah. No. I'm. I'm. Uh, this is my creative, my creative center. You know. I mean, it's like. I mean, I go home to Hawaii to recharge and and like and like, and like that that feeds me really strongly. Creatively. That, that satisfies but your wanderlust. Yeah, and here I can get down to work. That's why yeah. I feel like I can get down to work and get things done. It's and, that whole notion of like the wood shutters. Yeah. Town, especially in the winter. I, you know, and I love the winter. People go, oh, the winter must be terrible. Man, I don't mind at all. Bring the winter on. I'll dig in, stock the house with some wine, some groceries, and then just work, you know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, speaking of wine, City Winery on the 2nd. Yep, August 2nd. Of April. It is Frank Oral solo and amazing. Um, Poi Dog continues, and we will see Poi Dog again in the fall yep. with a new... How far along is this EP? Are, are, you, are you just kind of... It's... um. It's, um, I, it's an interesting phase. I, I, I really put it on, uh, here's, here's the thing. Every time we make a record, we make it in a different way. Um, we, we've never recorded in the same studio twice. We, we, like you said Racine, I remember now we had a studio in this. That's why I flipped out when you said Racine. It's like, we used to have a studio there. So before we did, uh, In Sea Comes Fruit, we woodshedded most of the stuff inside there that building right there. You know, is it superstition that keeps you from recording in the same place? Or just no, that? it's literally just like, um, um, let's say when we moved to town, we started recording at Battery Studios, but we needed, we wanted more time. We don't like to go in the studio. Like when you go in the studio and you're paying by the hour, everybody stresses out about, yeah. I got to get a good take, and then they don't get a good take because right, they're stressing cause out. Right, because you're forcing it, yeah. So then what we'll do is we'll rent stuff. So we rent an old disused basketball gym in Cabrini yeah, right. to record Pomegranate. And then... Um, uh, for natural thing, we had a space on like Fullerton. It was a rehearsal space, and we recorded a lot of it out of there. Um, the the In Sea Comes Fruit we did down on uh, Milwaukee Avenue. We had a space down there. We did a lot of the work there, and at Studio Chicago. Um, and then so and then we did seven in an old Zenith in Wall to Wall Studios, which was an old Zenith Television studio. That's amazing. Yeah, and then so this time, um, but anyways, but go back to your original question. Um, is that um, a lot of times we'll demo up a bunch of songs and we'll go in the studio and we'll throw almost all of them out and walk away with songs that we wrote in the studio. So this time I'm going. This time I'm going like we're going to bypass that whole process completely. I, I just you know we're gonna we're we're just going to make the record right now. So everything we're doing is like going to make the record. So when you ask me where the process is, the process right now is me putting together like a few starting points and then we're we're right we're right in the moment right now where. Me and Ted and Martin, who are the two engineers, Ted's a guitar player and Martin's our mm-hmm. co-producer engineer, and we kind of work as a team producing the records, is that we're going to start sending it out to the band and everybody's just going to start working at it. People love to do it in their home studios. Sure. Like Susan says, like, you know, she loves to, like, have her pajamas on and do all of her string parts all day long, rather than, like, getting in the car, going in the studio and doing it totally for two hours, that. you know? So she gets to spend all the time she wants to create what she wants, and then... We put the pieces back together and we see what they are, and we kind of well, we kind of stretch out the song from there. So it's a, it's a nice process, and it's going to be a new one for us this time because I literally have not sent out any demos to the band at all. I'm, I'm just surprising them with them. 
That's amazing. And I, I do have a lot of bands who listen to this podcast. And I think you know, one great takeaway, and it may be something, something they already knew about you and Poor Dog, just you're doing art for its own sake. You're, you're, you're following your muse. And, it blows my mind every time we're on stage. And I, you know, I look over and I see Cornell. Cornell's like, he's fire chief up in Racine. You know, there's, you know, Doug Julen, you know, do, the, all these people, they had, they're busy with their own things, but they still managed to come together yeah. for these shows and to do this thing. And they, and it's out of love, you know, yeah. it's out of love. That's true. I love it. Yeah. Uh, Frank Oral, on the second, you are here at City Winery. Uh, we've been eating City Winery's food. Thank you, City Winery. Yeah, thank you. Uh, for, for feeding us tonight and giving us yummy food. Delicious. That gazpacho is ridiculous. The duck smells amazing. Uh, this podcast is brought to you by Boost Mobile. If you like it, please tell a friend. And please continue to support this man, his band, amazing music. That is Frank Oral right there, for God's sakes. How do you do, folks? Thank you.